Nadine Wall Palmer describes herself as a writer and creator of stories, books, songs, poetry, scripts, comedy, music and theatre. She spent much of her time as a child writing and illustrating her own work and developed her writing skills studying an MA in Creative and Critical Writing at the University of Sussex. Nikki Gamble talked to Nadine about her debut middle grade children's novel, The Tunnels Below, an inventive and magical story about the power of friendship and the importance of self-belief. Your book is a debut children's yeah. novel, and so there'll be lots of people listening into our podcast who might not yet have discovered the tunnels below. So I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about yourself, and then Absolutely. we'll dig into your story. Fabulous. Well, at the root of me, I'm a writer. Give me a pen and I'll write it. Poetry, songs, um, books, plays, like you said, I'm working on that at the moment. Um, I started my sort of career and my writing journey um, when I was a school librarian at St Nicholas Preparatory School. And from there I really got um, a feel for how to approach children's writing, which is what I wanted to do. Because I kind of, I did my degree in creative and critical writing at Mm -hmm. Sussex University. I did an MA and I learned how to edit my work um, and sort of be present with it. But I just sort of assumed that I would just be able to write a children's book. And I think that's the mistake. I think writing a children's book is one of the hardest kinds of writing you can do. And I remember going into the library and reading to all these different age groups from nursery right up to year six leavers. And I I, I wanted to dictate to them, oh, they're going to really like this book. They're going to really like this. And the things that I thought that children would like were my idea of what I liked. Mm -hmm. They were very sort of varied in their choices. And so I actually learned to listen to the children and that was my first sort of foray into writing for children was actually learning to listen and observe and I was so lucky to have that experience. So that's how I where I started writing. Mm. A couple of things then. Um, Did you find that as readers that they were quite different to your childhood self as a reader? Because I get the sense in reading your books that you must have been an avid reader because of some of the turn of phrase mm. which is almost archaic sometimes yeah. you know and I mean that in the nicest no, yeah. sense I mean you talk about comely some you yeah. know that's not everyday speech that it's must have purpose. come from your reading well I can honestly attri- attribute that to um probably first and foremost the book of poems that my my mum gave me by Christina Rossetti mm. and I loved her language and I learned some of them off by heart one of which I still know um but actually it's funny you mentioned that we didn't know I was dyslexic as a kid and my sister was an avid reader she basically ate books mm. and it was quite overwhelming for me and quite intimidating so I was very specific about the books I read and it took me a long time and I never understood why I wasn't a fast reader like every, everyone else but what I found and what I did do in my degree, I spent days and days in bed reading books. And that's where I really, really learned to read like quickly and but efficiently and taking the information was at uni. So before that, I had to be very specific about the books that I chose to read because I just couldn't read as fast as everyone else. I never understood it. But what I can tell you is that from that experience, the books that I did read, I could probably tell you the whole story from start to finish. And so there are things like The Hobbit, a book called Friedrich, Black Beauty, um, Matilda, like books that I really, really specifically chose, The Witches. All of those things have probably just sort of bled into me. Another book called My Friend Flicker. But these books, I had to to go, well, well, I don't have the time that everybody else has to read. So I think that's where my sort of slightly archaic language comes from is that mix of books that I had to choose and then I read mountains of poetry yeah. I was about I remember I was about eight or nine and I found a collection of Philip Larkin on my mum's bookshelf and it was a collected um, anthology of all of his works and I just sat I didn't understand half of it but I sat there I went through it I still remember reading those as well and so more complicated and then having to talk to my mum about it mm. But um, so I think that's where some of that language yeah. comes from. And my editor, there was, there was, um, I really wanted to use the word went. Yeah. And my editor was like, my editor Sarah was like, I think that's, <laughs> that's a step too far. We'll take that out. Oh. 
So we need to talk about your book, yes. uh, the, uh, the Tunnels Below. Perfect. Can you just set the story up for of us? Of course I can. Um, the Tunnels Below is a sort of coming-of-age rites of passage story about a, a, young, a young girl, 12-year-old girl, um, called Cecilia Hudson Gray, who wakes up on the morning of her 12th birthday, very ordinary day, has breakfast with her mum, dad and her sister, um, and her sister gives her a marble from um, a sort of bric-a-brac store that she's been to with her nan and her sister's made it into a necklace for her to wear for the day and Cecilia's really a, kind of opposed to it because she likes the marble which it's not that cool anyway they go on the tube they're going on for a day out they head down to the tube um the London underground and um Cecilia sort of starts to feel a bit wheezy she's noticing strange things and as they're changing trains she calls out to her sister and says look um, Hester, can I take this off because it's too heavy? I'll, I'll just carry it. And she's her sister's a bit upset, but it gets knocked out of her hand, falls out of the clasp, um, and then it rolls and bounces back onto an empty train that is standing at the station. Mm-hmm. She runs on, grabs it, turns to leave, and the door shut, and she's whizzed away. And when mm-hmm. it stops, she's in this other world mm. and the tunnels below which is below mm. and those uh, spaces mm. they do invite oh. that kind of speculation don't they mm. I mean the London Underground there are are there not unused platforms yeah, there's unused and... stations there's the also the postal rail that I tried to go to but the man in front of me was with his little daughter and he got to the front of the queue and the lady said oh no this this ticket's for two weeks time and he was like oh I've got my daughter for the day, and I, I was like, oh, I'm going to have to do it, aren't I? Oh. I gave him my ticket, so I never got on that rail. But before he left, I said, oh, um, what's your daughter's name? And he said, oh, she's called Zephira, um, which is like the wind. And so I walked away that day, and I thought, there must be a reason. I said, ah, she's the name of the winds that blow around the tunnel. Oh, so I put her in my book. Yeah. <laughs> There has to be a reason. So, but there's a lot of the dark spaces, the way the shadows are cast in places like that. Um, sometimes you'll go through some tunnels, I think, especially when you're going to places like Victoria and you get a glimpse of these little spaces beyond or tunnels going off somewhere else lit by light and you think, there's got, there's got to be something mm. down there. Mm. So that's where that comes yeah, mm. come from. So in your story, mm. um, Cecilia mm-hmm. um, meets, to begin with, they they're creatures that are human, but they have animal features, features shall we say, don't yeah. they? And the first one that she meets, he's... Um... Koofy, he's the fox face. Yeah. Some people call him Cuffy, it's up to you. Um, I'm not here to dictate, it's yeah. your journey too, but um, he's a fox face. Where did that kind of I mean, there are obviously lots of stories with anthropomorphised yeah. animals. We're not quite sure where these fit in yes. terms of the human Good. or the animal. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Good, that's the point. Um, it came from, I, I started writing all sorts of different versions of this book at uni. And in my second year of university, I woke up in the middle of the night and I genuinely thought, just for a split second, that I saw a young man with antlers on his head standing in my room. I was a university student, so I just sort of fluffed it away and went back to sleep. But when I woke up in the morning, it had really stuck with me that I'd seen this stag boy, stag man who was very much a in human form with these antlers, sort of furry, that exact, exactly what I'm, I'm mm. describing in the book. And I sat down and I thought, oh, I'll draw that picture. And I drew a picture of, of him, mm-hmm. and that's the character that turns out to be Luke. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it all started there. I've had a fascination with corvus birds, so magpies, crows. I love all those sort of folk stories, um, Nordic tales of... Odin and I feel like those um, those kinds of passerini clawy birds carry messages so that's another reason why the Corvus community got created in the book as well mm-hmm. so and that's the antagonist is yeah. one of these so yeah. he's called my favorite name in the book <laughs> you even got me looking because he's called Jacques Dor yes with the French spelling exactly Jack of gold yes 
And you even got me thinking, is that the origin of Jackdaw then? <laughs> you know, you even yes. got me thinking there. So I did go and look and, and know it isn't. No, it, is, it isn't. <laughs> no, he's an, and so he's an albino bird, which yeah. is, and that's why they all follow, follow him as well, because it's kind of exploring the idea of how sometimes we're so curious about rarity and that it, it, it gives people power and popularity, even though he's actually, it turns out he's not that powerful. What's his motivation? It's the sparkly things, mm. and um, you know he he also collects the tears of the dwellers, which is what those creatures mm. are called. They're called the dwellers. They all dwell in these places below. Um, yeah, he he collects the sparkles, and also just he's got a sort of ego problem. Mm. <laughs> so it has to be said that in this world, the currency mm. are things like buttons. Buttons. So one of the first things Cecilia has to do is to take, take the buttons, buttons off her off. coat. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there's a good reason for that as well. I mean, I, I, yeah, I collect information from surroundings all the time. I'm very observational. While I travel on the London Underground, and I, I still see it now. Every so often, you'll just see an abandoned button. And I just, for some reason, it's just, it sticks with me. These things that fasten us together also fasten, could be used to fasten a community and, a, and act as a currency. So I thought, what would be not money, but could still be in that sort of little, that exchangey form? I thought, all oh, buttons, yeah. those ones that we see scattered about. I used to love, my grandmother used to have a button jar. <gasps> so did my mum. And they were amazing. You'd get to, I remember oh. one set of buttons that were like little ladybirds. Yes. I absolutely loved yeah. those. I tell you what, it's mm. time for a reading. We've yes. got to get into yeah, the of story. Course. <laughs> of course. So I thought I'd read you the section where Cecilia um, gets lost. So she's just calling over to her sister to say, mm. Actually, I don't know if I want to wear this necklace. I'm not feeling so good. Mm. Hester, Cecilia called as she caught up with her sister. I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to take the necklace off for a bit. It's quite heavy and I'm not feeling so good. Oh, OK, said Hester. She looked a little bit upset. I didn't think of that. I know. I'll make it into a ring when we get home instead. Sure, said Cecilia, hoping she would forget. Cecilia paused a moment and undid the knot of string around her neck, sighing with relief as it came off. But as she held the marble in her hand, a passerby knocked it out of her grasp. The marble came loose from its wire setting and fell to the floor. She watched it bounce heavily along the ground, heading back towards the platform they'd come from. Cecilia hurried after it, trying to catch it as she went. It bounced and landed with a thud back on the empty train that was still waiting on the platform. Speeding towards the carriage, she saw a flash of bright light as she jumped across the yellow line and landed on board. Seizing the marble in her hand, she shoved it in her coat pocket and turned back to leave. But as she did so, the doors beep, 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 and slid shut. And in an instant, she was swallowed whole. In the distance, she could see her family rushing towards her through the smudged glass as the train snaked away into the tunnel ahead. Cecilia became aware very quickly that she was the only passenger on board. She began to panic when the train failed to stop at any of the stations that it passed, some with names she'd never heard of before. It travelled faster and faster, deeper and deeper. She could tell because her ears kept popping and she kept trying to yawn to release the pressure. All at once she was plunged into darkness. She had never experienced darkness like it, thick and heavy. Frightening thoughts formed and danced into the black and became frenzied before, snap, the carriage lights flashed back on, flickering like blinking eyes. She sucked in her breath, feeling the train slow to a stop. Steadying herself, she watched as the train arrived at a station. The doors opened, an invitation for her to get off, but this was a station she definitely didn't recognise. Cecilia stood frozen in the artificial light of the train carriage for some time before even daring to breathe. She could see from the light being thrown out on the other side of the doors that there was a small platform covered in soot. She waited for something to happen. Nothing happened. There was only stillness, silence and the imperceptible passing of time. No clock ticked, but she felt as though an eternity was passing through her with each beat of her heart. A dusty mouse, scuffling through the soot, brought her back to the moment. Was it wearing a pair of shoes and a jumper? Cecilia moved closer to look, but it had already disappeared. Now at the mouth of the doors, she knew for the first time in her life 
the weight of being nowhere. She looked for signs. There were none. She called for a response. Hello, hello. None came. After what felt like hours of waiting and shouting for help, her fear abandoned her briefly and she stepped off the train. No sooner had she left the train did the doors clap shut and the train leave her. Oh, stop mm, fantastic. Now, um, the marble is quite interesting. We mm. won't say what it is, but it's not exactly what it seems. And one of the things that um, I wanted to ask you about is that objects seem really important to you. We talked a little bit about the buttons mm. and we've got the marble, but they seem to have a kind of power beyond themselves very often. I love that you asked me that because I'm, <laughs> I, I really feel like they do. I feel like objects carry energy with them um, and they possess their own energy. Um, but I love the idea of divining information from objects and the fact that they have a life of their own that's not necessarily documented. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a marble mm -hmm. that I have had since I was a child. I have two actually that, I, that were the inspiration for this. Um, that I got from a shop, I think it was down across from Wandsworth Common in the Lucky Parrot, back when I was probably about sort of nine or ten. We all played marbles, but I always felt like these marbles were a little bit special. And I all, I've always wondered where they were before they were in that shop. And some of these objects that feel very present and belong to now, that you think, oh... This was probably just made in a factory, something like a marble, you know, three, three years ago and it's been transported over here. We don't actually know that because they can't tell us. And so I, or I am very, I'm always curious of those journeys. So Cecilia's on the platform and she meets Kufi. Yeah. Obviously, she's not going to want to stay there. She's <laughs> got, want to, we always want to get back home. to her, her home and her family. It's a little bit like an Alice in Wonderland mm -hmm. story, and yeah. as much as it, she could have fallen down the rabbit yeah. hole, she meets lots of creatures, mm. dwellers while she's there, and their logic is not her logic. Yep. Um, were there any particular stories that were kind of there fermenting and influencing you, do Absolutely. you think? I mean, Alice in Wonderland is a given. I, was, I loved that. It's a beautiful book. I love it. I still love it. It still makes me feel like magic when I read it. Then um, I think I realised while I was going through the publishing and stuff that there's a time in The Hobbit when Bill Baggins gets lost in some dark tunnels mm. and I, it all sort of came flooding back to me as mm. so I was 11 years old sitting in the basement in an armchair stuck to that book. So these are very real spaces for me in my mind and the London Underground is a real space and you can get lost. So it's really easy to see how lots of different influences are woven into your mm. story but then there's the task of actually creating a novel which is more than just a collection mm. of ideas and thoughts so what was that process like for you that's hard <laughs> i read a book by a guy called haruki murakami actually called the um what i talk about when i'm talking about running and i did a lot of running at the same time as writing this book and i get it i personally had to get up at 4, 4.30am to piece this together in the quiet and stillness of the world because I needed that backdrop of just silence or it was just going to be a splurge and I did a lot of timed sessions so I do something called a 50 minute flash um, which is 50 minutes on the clock and you just write for 50 minutes, you get a 10 minute break then you start over, thanks to Fitbit they gave me, they gave me this and I use it religiously to time everything I had to be really disciplined like I think more so than any other writing I've done before and I've just I've just been writing something new but this was hard because it's in the dark I needed it to be dark so when summer came and I was writing it in the summer I really I couldn't do it I really struggled I really really struggled to write it as soon as the the winter started to come back in it was I just wrote the rest of it in a month and gave it to my editor interesting yeah yeah what parts of the writing were you most pleased with oh, that's a that's a difficult question i mean getting the whole thing out and getting it to make sense 
I'm pretty pleased with that because I rang my sister. I got stuck in the middle. <laughs> And my sister crying and said, Lou, I don't think I can do this. She was like, and my sister's a teacher, so she sort of to talk me through it. I was like, yes, you can, come on. It's just, it's growth, it's pain. Mm. Like, you've got to grow out of some of the ideas and let them go as well. So maybe I'm most pleased with the writing in, in the edits, mm. in being able to let go of things that I loved. And yes. Yeah, so, yeah. That's hard, it's isn't it? So hard. Your like, pet sentences... Yeah. They're not needed. You're like, oh, maybe I'll too many some... ideas. Yeah. That one's got to yeah. disappear. But Learned. then you're left with really strong yeah. imagery. And it's I important mean... not to take away from what the audience, what that individual is going to experience by overflowering it and yes. putting in too many messages or morals or yeah. philosophies. So, yeah. yeah. I have to say, just in terms of imagery, I loved the lamentations yeah. and the lake <laughs> yeah. where... They have to be sad and cry yeah. to create this. In fact, you, like, yeah, you asked me about um, influences, and my my biggest influence is Orpheus and Eurydice. My mum used to tell it to the Greek myth, mm. and where Orpheus, Orpheus loses Eurydice and has to go back to Hades and collect her. And I think that lamentation all comes from the idea of it's like the river sticks mm. and those crossings and the and the grief and. At funerals, sometimes it happens, and not be to be too too sort of dark. But the, there's a music that happens when there's a group of people crying mm. that you very rarely hear, mm. and I think that's probably what the Lamentations is about. Like I imagine an almost a vocal orchestra of people crying because we all cry differently, and what that sounds like in a muffled tunnel below. So. Oh. It would be, yeah, I've yet to write that song in the musical, so that's going to be interesting. That's amazing, mm. yeah. And in terms of character, was there a particular creation that you were really happy with? Oh, Jacques, Jacques Dor. Yeah. I, I love writing a villain. Yeah. You get to do and be and say all the things you would never do in real life. Um, you get to be unkind for a minute, which is not in my nature at all. I also love Luke, bringer of light and all that, so yeah. And also, to, to, to a point, there's just a moment with this little Robin face called Robbie. I really liked writing him, and I think he might have been... He's loose. in the market, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he sells grub. Mm. <laughs> Which are the worms. Oh yeah. my gosh, that was disgusting. <laughs> you took me to a place yeah. where I was eating those worms. Oh, I, <laughs> I was obsessed with worms when I was a kid as well. Um, but I... I think he might be loosely based on Jamie Oliver. <laughs> like, sort of twittering around. You know how Jamie Oliver twitters yeah. around the kitchen and sort of collect, all right, yeah, how are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Confession. Yeah. Mm. And there's a singer in mm. here as well, Ladybug. Lady Bird. Yeah. Oh, Lady Bird. Lady Bird. Not Ladybug. Yeah. That's the American version, mm. Lady Bird. Um, is she based on you in any way? I'd say there's definitely a part of me, but I think it's the that that singer in all of us who just loves to sing and can bring those tears because what she brings to people is the taste of tears. So she moves them. To, the, the idea is that her her voice moves people to to taste of tears and tears. So she gets used for those weekly lamentations to get everyone down there, and she sings and everyone cries. So you can imagine sort of this cacophony of <laughs> crying and singing. Mm. <laughs> I think mm. we might need to hear yeah. a song. Let's do it. Does the song have a title? Yeah, it's called One for Sorrow. So it's the one for sorrow, two for joy, three for a girl, four for a boy. Back. It's based on that. So, okay. <laughs> I found no room for joy This is my one for sorrow Cause I found no room for joy And I was just a girl I was just a girl Back when I met my boy Threads turn slowly silver. All I have is this 
tune to hold. In a world made of glitter and gold, in a world made of glitter and gold, in a world made of glitter and gold. Oh, 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 So I always keep my secret, and I swear it's never to be told. No one for sorrow, and it's the only friend, the only friend I'll ever know. I just need a little file to put my tears in there. <laughs> okay, that's exactly it. And uh, can I just say, your music brings us not much sorrow, but much joy. Oh, and so does your writing. So, thank you. Nadine Wild Palmer, oh, thank you so much me. for joining us yeah. in the Reading Corner. I loved it. I loved it. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to In the Reading Corner with Just Imagine. If you've enjoyed this podcast, you can find many more on the podcast section of our website, justimagine.co.uk plus via iTunes or your usual podcast provider. Don't forget to pass the pod and recommend this fantastic free resource to your friends and colleagues. Just Imagine also has a free fortnightly newsletter packed full of the latest news, CPD training, reviews and giveaways. To sign up, visit justimagine.co.uk forward slash newsletter.